The purpose of this video is to go back and review many of the concepts uh, which we discussed in class talking about the cardiovascular changes and adaptation to uh, exercise. Over the course of this unit, uh, many of the topics that we kind of uh, worked through uh, went one by one, so kind of breaking everything down individually, building the structure and function of the cardiovascular system, working our way through cardiac output and how we deliver blood uh, to the body, then acute exercise, finally with chronic training. Uh, this video is really just going to kind of sum up those acute and chronic training and we're going to take a different approach to give you just uh, a little bit maybe a different viewpoint in how these adaptations occur. This entire video is really going to focus on uh, using the FIC equation. So the FIC equation is uh, an incredibly powerful tool uh, that, ra while rather short, packs so much information uh, that we can then break down. So let's talk about what the FIC equation is uh, and how we can use it. So ultimately, the FIC equation is two parts. It uh, allows us to calculate VO2, or oxygen consumption, and it is calculated as cardiac output multiplied by AVO2 difference. What this uh, uh, equation ultimately tells us is that we have a relationship between cardiovascular function, so cardiac output, or heart, uh, of course, pumping and moving blood throughout the system, and our skeletal muscle metabolism. Right? The idea that uh, we extract or oxygen diffuses from the cardiovascular system into skeletal muscle where it is then used for uh, aerobic metabolism. And ultimately, that's exactly what oxygen consumption is and does. It tells us, us the amount of energy, or ATP, that is produced by aerobic metabolism. So the way I, I think about it, and as a, a, a weird ana analogy that we used in class, is talking about what determines how much food you might eat over Thanksgiving. One is how much you load your plate up with, or how much you take back to the table, and thinking of that as cardiac output. So here's how much we're ultimately going to take are multiplied by the amount of food in which you ultimately consume. So how much uh, you take from your plate to put into um, your mouth. And so uh, that's ultimately the way we can view this. We can break then the FIC equation down into uh, slightly more, more uh, components. So specifically, you know, cardiac output or commonly abbreviated Q is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. So oftentimes you'll see people rewrite the FIC equation as oxygen consumption, or again, ATP produced via aerobic metabolism is equal to heart rate times stroke volume times, here's our AVO2 difference definition kind of spelled out, the arterial oxygen content minus our venous oxygen content. Again, give us an idea of how much oxygen we deliver we measured on, on the other side of the capillary how much is left. That tells us how much oxygen then went from the artery into the muscle for metabolism. What we're going to do now is we're going to essentially break down how each of these components change uh, with uh, both acute exercise and chronic training. So if we look at uh, our first variable, so here we'll look at our FIC equation and pull out cardiac output. Cardiac output um, is uh, again given in liters per minute and essentially tells us how much blood the, um, the heart pumps in a minute. Okay. And in this scenario we have both untrained and trained and, and you'll see I'll use this color scheme throughout uh, this presentation so that green is going to reflect trained both here and later on. If we look, we can also compare both absolute and relative. Absolute uh, being given uh, an exact workload, so an exact power output, for example, run three miles an hour, work at 50 watts, etc., etc. The other uh, thing that we can look at is, is a relative. Relative typically meaning relative to your maximal power output or your maximal v or, or your VO2 max or your maximal oxygen consumption. And so uh, it's often that we look at both of these. And so I, I include in these first few graphs these uh, general uh, ideas of both absolute and relative as we go out. So if we look at cardiac output, again, for any given exercise intensity, we can pull out several things. So one, we can say resting values are exactly the same. 
doesn't matter if you're uh, an elite marathoner or a sedentary individual, our resting values for both are five liters per minute. If we then look at a given intensity, so let's say uh, three miles an hour, the way I like to think about it is if in order to run three miles an hour, you need to produce three miles an hour worth of ATP. In order to do that, you need a given oxygen consumption and a given uh, uh, AVO2 difference to produce exactly three miles an hour worth of ATP. If we think about it in simple terms, the muscle is just needed to produce that exact amount and therefore a sedentary and a trained person will produce the exact same cardiac output for any given exercise intensity or any given absolute exercise intensity. However, you'll note that, of course, training allows us to increase and improve our VO2 max and allows us to increase and go to higher exercise intensities than an untrained individual, such that it's not uncommon to see cardiac outputs much, much higher in a trained individual than in an untrained individual. So, for example, what, what I've shown here, numbers that we've seen uh, in class is maximal for an untrained Looking at males and females, in general, 18 to 25 liters per minute. If we look at max trained, we've seen uh, a couple numbers in here, but you know, someone who's uh, pretty active uh, and, and in good shape, maybe 30. Uh, maybe really, really high endurance athlete type people can go all the way up to 30. So. 30 to 40 liters per minute as maximal cardiac outputs. So there's our, our relative term, or our absolute. If we look in terms of relative, what we can say is because this person's VO2 max is at a much higher intensity, then for any given percentage of exercise intensity, the well-trained person is actually going to be working much harder. So they're gonna be at a speed that is higher than an untrained individual in these cases. Therefore, they must make more ATP because they're running at a faster speed. Therefore, in a relative sense, cardiac output is always greater in a trained individual over an untrained individual given a relative percent of VO2 max. So now what we can do is, of course, pull out the other half of uh, or, or divide our cardiac output numbers into its uh, two groups. So we have both heart rate and stroke volume. We'll start with heart rate. So in general, when we, when we look at, at heart rate, what we can say is training decreases resting heart rate, it decreases it relatively significant. Again, we've discussed this in class, but resting heart rates for sedentary individuals is a little bit all over the place in a huge range. 60 to 100 is kind of your uh, general clinical definition. Uh, we'll stick with something kind of somewhere in the middle, right? Maybe 75 beats per minute. Here. In general, rest are resting for well-trained individuals for uh, heart rate uh, can go much lower. So as we talked about, it's it's uh, been reported that you know. Uh, winning elite athletes can get into the upper 30s, uh, 40s aren't that uncommon, but we'll just say here, so resting heart rate for um, a trained individual would be roughly about 50 beats per minute. Again, this idea that we lower resting heart rate. As we begin to exercise, what we see is, of course, a linear uh, increase in heart rate as we go, uh, as we ex increase exercise intensities. This linear increase is due to two things. So we have those pulled out here. So uh, we remove or reduce parasympathetic nervous stimulation uh, of the uh, SA node in order to get our heart rate up uh, to go from resting to 100 beats per minute. Once we get from 100, then further increases in heart rate are all driven by increases in sympathetic nervous system in order to go from 100 to maximal heart rate. So again, parasympathetic gets you from whatever your resting value is up to 100, above 100, all sympathetic nervous system. So as we look, we can look at for any given absolute exercise intensity, 
heart rate is lower in trained individuals than in untrained individuals. The other thing that we can note is maximal heart rate is not changed. So for any given intensity, our maximal heart rate is untrained. And in general, the way we calculate this is 220 minus your age. So same for this one. So 220 minus your age. Again, doesn't really matter uh, what uh, uh, how well trained you are. In general, most people say uh, your max heart rate is 220 minus your age. So for a 20-year-old college student, uh, you would have 220 minus 20 or 200 beats per minute, as we show here. If we look at relative, we, we can actually see that heart rate lies exactly on top of each other. So as exercise intensity increases, as a percentage of maximal, uh, um, a percentage of VO2 max that the uh, lines lay on top of it, each other exactly. Again, the idea that uh, these people are working at harder intensities have to produce more ATP and need a higher cardiac output. So if we can think about this, that at a relative intensity that uh, heart rate uh, isn't any different, then how, of course, are we getting these increases in cardiac output? That leads us to our third and final uh, part of this, which is, of course, stroke volume. Stroke volume uh, is the major kind of component and major driver of increase in cardiac output during exercise and with exercise training and will be a large focus of, of the rest of this review. So if we look at stroke volume again uh, at rest in our absolute uh, conditions, so resting cardiac our stroke volume is roughly 70 milliliters. Trained individuals are able to have a much larger stroke volume at rest, which makes sense because if we have the same cardiac output being heart rate times stroke volume, a lower heart rate means in order to get that same number for cardiac output, we must, of course, multiply by a higher number. And so it's not uncommon to uh, be roughly 100 milliliters or so per each beat of the heart or our stroke volume. As we look through, what we can see is for any given absolute intensity, again, let's say, for example, three miles an hour, stroke volume is higher in trained individuals than untrained. We should easily make the comparison then that, again, heart rate for any absolute intensity is lower. Stroke volume, therefore, must be higher and uh, therefore, cardiac output ultimately remains e uh, even. So again, understanding the relationships between these two and how they relate to cardiac output is incredibly important. What we'll see here, though, is uh, the classic thing is we see that uh, at a given intensity, in general, untrained individuals will plateau in stroke volume, so linear increase, then flat across, whereas Train individuals, linear increase, and what you notice is this plateau in stroke volume happens at a higher intensity. We can actually move over to our relative curve. They're showing exactly the same thing. Stroke volume in general higher than uh, the stroke volume. In, stroke volume in a trained is higher than stroke volume in an untrained, which makes sense because our heart rate lines, remember, laid right on top of each other, but 25% of VO2 max in a trained person is a higher intensity, higher cardiac output needed. Therefore, stroke volume must be higher given that heart rate is exactly the same as an untrained individual. And if we were to kind of draw these again, as we mentioned, for an untrained person, we see that, that this person plateaus at roughly 40% of VO2 max. In a well, trained individual, this person plateaus at intensities much higher uh, than this if they plateau at all. For our class, we'll just kind of keep it at they, they do plateau here, but again, maybe somewhere in the 75% of VO2 max range. Again, telling us that we're able to, de to then create a lot more cardiac output, not because maximal heart rate increases, as we saw before, it does not, but because maximal stroke volume increased. And so we can kind of pull out some numbers. So uh, what we talked about in class is maximal untrained cardiac output is maybe roughly uh, 120 mils 
and if we look uh, in the text, there's a couple different uh, figures, but uh, 150 to 180, and even uh, potentially up to 200 milliliters uh, as we kind of look. So uh, those are some numbers that, that we had used in different figures and different charts in the book. So again, here's the idea that we get most of our improvements in our cardiac output because of improvements in stroke volume. And therefore, a lot of the Fick equation and breaking it down this way really then allows us to focus in on these three parts. So stroke volume is preload, contractility, and afterload. So how much uh, blood is in the heart just before it contracts, otherwise known as in diastolic volume, contractility, or the force in which the heart uh, squeezes and contracts in order to pump blood out, and then afterload, which we can really just highlight as mean arterial blood pressure. Or simply, we can just think of it as blood pressure. The idea that uh, when we get changes in these variables, then we can ultimately cause uh, improvements in VO2. So uh, what we're going to look and see is that with exercise, preload is increased, contractility is increased, and after load is increased. However, we'll note that this increase is actually considered negative. Okay. Because after load tells us the pressure in which the heart must work against in order to uh, pump blood up. So a very high after load actually causes a reduction in stroke volume. So if we can break them down, all three increase, let's talk about how each of these then uh, can be looked at. So if we think about preload, the three main mechanisms that we talked about of how we return more blood back to the heart and therefore increasing in diastolic volume is three primary ways. Right? We get an increase in blood sent back by the skeletal muscle pump, essentially the rhythmic pumping action of squeezing blood back, to, uh, back up to the heart during exercise. Increase in rate of breathing stimulates what we have as the respiratory pump. Um, and last but not least, we also increase venoconstriction, aka just like our arteries, we squeeze and contract the veins uh, at least to a small degree in order to push blood flow back up to the heart. All three of these, of course, contribute uh, to the increase in preload, preload with at least as an exercise physiologist, our major concern being the skeletal muscle pump delivering a large majority of that blood back. We'll note that there are no acute changes in blood volume or viscosity to have any effects on either preload or afterload in this scenario during acute exercise. And then as we know, preload is increased, uh, uh, is preload uh, increases stroke volume due to the Frank Starling, and I'll add a slide here a little bit in, uh, in just a second. If we look at contractility of the heart, contractility is uh, increased uh, primarily due to increased sympathetic uh, nervous system or increased circulating epinephrine and norepinephrine, which will then increase the force of the contra contractility of the heart. So we can say it's increased with acute exercise, and the mechanism we discussed in class of why this happens is more calcium from outside the cell or extracellular calcium is allowed into the heart in order to increase the force of the contraction. So here's a slide out of, out of lecture notes just to quickly remind you that our green curve here shows the Frank Starling mechanism that discusses when an increase in end diastolic volume, again we can just call this preload, then causes an increase in stroke volume. So as we move further on the right on the green curve, we see that we get an increase in stroke volume. This happens because an increase in preload or in diastolic volume stretches the ventricles. When we stretch the ventricles, we get closer to our optimal length, which increases the number of mice and crossbridge uh, formations. More crossbridge formations means greater strength of contraction, Greater strength of contraction means a greater amount of blood ejected uh, per beat, which of course is the definition of stroke volume. If we also look at contractility, again that's here in our orange curve that says this is independent of 
uh, of preload. This is just saying with sympathetic nervous st stimulation or epinephrine and norepinephrine, we're able to actually increase stroke volume and pump more blood out uh, in each beat. So of course, both of those contribute to the increase in uh, stroke volume as we move forward. The last one is, of course, afterload. And, and as we discussed, afterload is a, a negative or inversely related to uh, stroke volume. Higher afterloads means lower stroke volume. Lower afterloads means higher stroke volume. So what are our two major uh, effectors of afterload? We've discussed and showed the equation that afterload can be thought of as cardiac output and total peripheral or total vascular resistance. They mean exactly the same thing. So again, we do see an increase in afterload with exercise training, primarily because we increase our cardiac output. If you think about this in our example of a well-trained individual, five liters a minute up to 40 with exercise. So eight times more blood is flowing through our vessels. When you put that much volume again through vessels, then that has a tendency to, of course, drive up pressure in these vessels. We do have a way to kind of uh, mitigate or minimize this large increase in, uh, in, blood, uh, uh, in cardiac output to kind of dampen or, or reduce our increase in blood pressure. And the reason and the way that we're able to do that is we're able to decrease our peripheral resistance. The two mechanisms in which we, we learn that are primarily responsible for this is one, vasodilation in the arterioles going to skeletal muscle. And as you'll remember, uh, this is raised to a factor of four. So when we change uh, the size of the vessel that we're actually uh, changing uh, the resistance by a factor of four. So uh, very small changes means huge, huge uh, uh, changes uh, in resistance. We also open up more capillaries. We discussed that uh, at rest, as low as 50, as high as 80% of capillaries are open. During maximal exercise, again, we open more vessels, giving us more places to essentially put all this cardiac output. So uh, this is a slide that I, I pulled out of class and, and have kind of added into that, that just kind of show that, again, cardiac output, amount of blood, total vascular resistance, or uh, peripheral vascular resistance, or total peripheral resistance, all the same thing, is the sum of the resistance to blood flow by all systemic blood vessels. So ultimately, we can uh, get a balance between these, and that leads us again to our look at blood pressure. In general, we can think about blood pressure, again, here in dynamic exercise. Here's our 120 over 80 is our normal blood pressure with our mean arterial pressure uh, being uh, slightly below somewhere in the middle, typically uh, around 90, 95 uh, millimeters of mercury. As we exercise, diastolic blood pressure should stay relatively the same, but systolic blood pressure uh, uh, will go up and therefore we'll see afterload. Again, nothing too crazy to see 220 millimeters of mercury uh, at, at really high uh, exercise intensities. That of course means that our mean arterial pressure then of course does increase and so again our afterload is increased with exercise, but again, we're dampening it. So it makes sense that we do see an increase in blood pressure, but not a huge uh, uh, increase that would be what one would think about if we were uh, putting eight times more volume into the same vessels. So if we look at these uh, uh, scenarios under uh, following exercise training, again, we're, we're back with our green color to kind of uh, give you this idea, but uh, we can look at these same changes of what happens with chronic exercise training. Here we see preload. Again, resting preload is increased, and the primary driver of why uh, preload is increased is we get an increase in blood volume, mainly driven by an increase in plasma volume, potentially some uh, increases in the number of red blood cells or hemoglobin carrying cells. Uh, that uh, can be, of course, uh, potentially debatable. We do know if you do increase red blood cells that uh, that will be very beneficial uh, for exercise performance and, and oxygen consumption as we move forward. Contractility 
with training, this is debatable. Again, some studies with, uh, with animals suggest it does happen, maybe or maybe not increases. So we know preload is increased, contractility. We'll put an increased here, but it's our maybe. We'll note that afterload, yes, afterload is increased, but what I really want you to kind of understand is that the afterload isn't really changed compared to an untrained individual. So afterload goes up, but our mean arterial blood pressure actually doesn't go up any higher than an untrained individual. And so we can kind of take a look at this here. Again, afterload and maximal blood pressure don't really change with exercise with, um, uh, with exercise training. So even though, again, our cardiac output may be more than double, we get an even greater increase or greater decrease in our total peripheral resistance. The kind of four reasons that we talked about this is less sympathetic constriction of vessels, increase in vasodilation in skeletal muscles, and more capillaries that can then be recruited. Again, we've, we've kind of talked about this as being uh, um, a major training adaptation is increasing capillary density or the number of capillaries, and therefore we can kind of spread out this higher cardiac output to kind of keep our increase in afterload at untrained or pre-training status. So that sums up the first half, cardiac output uh, part of the FIC equation. We'll finish up with the second half of AVO2 difference. So when you start to exercise, AVO2 difference of course increases, so we're able to essentially look at as we increase exercise intensity, going from walking, jogging, running to all out maximal 100% effort, we see that we take more uh, uh, oxygen out of the blood as exercise intensity increases. Again, telling us that when we measure on the arterial side and the venous side, at higher exercise intensity, we have more being pulled out, so less ending up in the venous side of things, which makes sense because, again, oxygen is being extracted or really diffused from the cardiovascular system into the muscle. And if we think about these high exercise intensities, we're going to need lots of oxygen in order to produce ATP via aerobic metabolism. If we look at training, what we can say is training actually increases maximal AVO2 difference. So in the graph I, I put in here uh, just from class suggests that an untrained individual uh, can pull out about 18 uh, mils of blood, mils of oxygen from the blood, and a trained person can pull out even more oxygen uh, from the blood. So if we think about why does that happen, we can ultimately revert to uh, back to our adaptations to exercise training. One, we potentially get a fiber type shift to an increase in more type 1 fibers, which are oxidative by nature. Two, we get an increase in capillary density. More capillaries means that we get a greater surface area. We get a, a smaller diffusion area in order for uh, oxygen to diffuse across. And because the surface area is so large, we actually have the potential to slow blood flow down through the capillaries, giving more time uh, for uh, oxygen to diffuse across the capillary bed into skeletal muscle. And then, of course, if we look inside the muscle, we have uh, the, the, the classic exercise adaptation being an increase in muscle mitochondrial content that tells us then we're able to use more oxygen as the final electron acceptor in order to make ATP. Um, so, therefore, we can kind of suggest that AVO2 difference is increased with exercise and endurance training increases it to even further levels. So hopefully uh, we've kind of given you a, a good idea of, of the FIC equation, so looking at oxygen consumption as it relates to cardiac output and AVO2 difference. I'll close with at least the general thought. So uh, uh, when we think about what the limitation is, just a reminder that we're uh, that under most conditions, most individuals are limited by, by the cardiovascular side of things. So the delivery of the oxygen, not the usage of oxygen in the skeletal muscle. And so as we think about this from the FIC equation, in general, we can think about this from kind of the cardiac output and blood flow side of things.